Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. Well, we are waking up seeing massive street demonstrations in Belarus. Um, we also uh, are, are learning that a leading pro-democracy activist in Hong Kong has been arrested. The government of Lebanon has resigned. Uh, but former UN Ambassador uh, Nikki Haley is uh, is really focused like a laser beam on the issues that matter. Did you see this uh, tweet? Okay, popcorn factory, two messed up birthday orders, missed delivery dates with no explanation. First time I gave you the benefit of the doubt, second one tells me not to buy from you again. Hashtag disappointed nephew. I'm going to leave that to historians to figure out what the context of that was. Well, uh, once again, we are having a normal one at the president's briefing yesterday. He had to leave the podium briefly after shots were fired. And then when he came back, he mused about cutting the capital gains tax and uh, made a series of claims about his handling of the pandemic that ranged from misleading to, well, we say, uh, shall we say, <laughs> pure bullshittery. Uh, you need to look at the fact checks. Uh, at one point, the president actually suggested the 1918 Spanish flu probably ended World War II, which actually didn't begin until two decades later. Well, with a foreign policy back in the headlines, um, at least at least for the moment, uh, we are very lucky to have today's uh, guest. We are joined by Jim Shuto, a CNN anchor and the chief national security correspondent for CNN, who has a new book with a rather extraordinary title of The Madman Theory, A Look at Donald Trump's Approach to Foreign Policy. Jim Shuto joins us on the Bulwark Podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm a loyal reader of you guys, so it's it's a real pleasure to be on. Well, let's just jump right into the news news of the day and and the questions that obsess me, and I'm I'm guessing uh, contribute to the success of your book. The Russian obsession with uh, the election continues. We are getting more reports that their efforts are ongoing, and yet the president and his administration continue not to push back, continue to be in denial on it. Can you explain for us, can you explain for me, what is, why is Donald Trump so deferential to Vladimir Putin? It's not an old question, but it's one that I still don't think I have a grasp on. I'm glad you asked it because look at this. I think this story is massively undercover that four years after Russia interfered in 2016, to help Donald Trump win, denigrate Hillary Clinton. They're doing it again. That is, again, the judgment of U.S. intelligence. It's public. They've said it publicly just in the last few days. And again, the sitting president, who Intel says is benefiting from this, will not call Russia out. And it's, it is remarkable, it's disturbing, and it's important. And I think it can't be lost in, in all the fog of the, of the coverage of this election. For this book, you know, and I'll just remind folks, I, I only spoke to people who worked for the Trump administration, current hmm. and former officials, people who were appointed by him, took the jobs willingly, and worked. Now, many of them are critics after they left, but some are loyalists, and they all work for him. And I asked everyone, can you explain to me and folks reading this book the president's deference to Russia? Can you explain it? Give me your best answer. And... The best answer that most of them could come up with, and this is remarkable, is that the president has an admiration for Vladimir Putin. He admires the man. He admires his power. He admires and somewhat envies the power that he has in his system, in the system of, well, authoritarian government in, in Russia. You, you've heard him say it in his public li comments before about him. He's a strong leader. Right. Well, you and I know what strong means in Russia. It means crushing dissent uh, and worse. Um, he also has a shared view of the world with Putin, a sort of nihilistic view of the world. Hmm. The president, you remember that famous hmm. interview or infamous interview with, with Bill O'Reilly in early 2017? Uh, O'Reilly says, but Putin's a killer, and Trump says, are we that much better? Yeah. Now that that was not a one-off, because remember, just in the last couple of weeks, when the president is pressed in the midst of not challenging Russia on bounties on the heads of U.S. soldiers, right, said, well, this is not the first time that they supplied arms to the Taliban in 2018. That, by the way, is intelligence that is not questioned by anyone. And the president gave a similar answer. He said, well, we supplied arms to the Taliban in the 80s, right? 
an, an equivalent equivalency between the U.S. and Russia. And, and that's the thing is that he has this admiration. And I'll tell you this, um, officials who work for the president uh, at the highest level said that Putin is aware of that admiration and seeks to capitalize on it uh, in a number of ways. This is This is something Americans need to be aware of. Whatever your view of the president is, he admires Putin, Putin knows it, and seeks to take advantage of it. Let's go back to this nihilism, because this is one of the most striking things. If there was one through line for American conservatism for 50 years before Trump, it was the rejection of the idea that there was moral equivalency between us and, say, Soviet Russia and, and our enemies. And there was a broad consensus on on the right that 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 America was an exceptional place, that we, in fact, were you know not simply morally equivalent to the thugs and dictators around the world. Donald Trump does not feel that way. And so leaving aside Vladimir Putin and whatever man crush he has on Vladimir Putin, this what you describe as as the as the moral the moral relativism of the president when it comes to national affairs is is really a striking departure from say Reaganism. It is. It's it's I got a whole section in the book called The End of American Exceptionalism. Because that is Trump's view, right? And not just in comparing us to someone like Russia, saying, hey, we're not that different, but, but in the way that he's conducted foreign policy. It is a zero-sum game. H.R. McMaster talks a lot in this book about how much trouble he had convincing Trump of not just the importance of, or the history of, but also the, the ancillary benefits of alliances that... It's not zero sum that, you know, the NATO alliance is not just about who's paying who and how much. It's about shared values. It's about shared intelligence. Uh, it's about uh, friends that you can rely on in a tough space. Uh, it's about soft power. But these are all things that they couldn't convince Trump of. And, and as you say, I mean, essential conservative values, essential uh, American Values. You know, it's interesting. You know, of course, I work for CNN, and you know, often, you know, I, I will, I will get you know, swings and arrows. Uh, here you are, you know, you're a Marxist, leftist, etc. And I always say to people, guys, I've done my homework on this. I've spent years covering China and Russia and other authoritarian states. I've been on the ground. I've seen them. I, I've spoken to the dissidents. Uh, I've seen, you know, the iron fist uh, of the way these folks operate. I, you know, I. I know that's uh, a horrible thing, and I've seen it in action. And to, to hear uh, an American president who sort of dismisses that or, or doesn't you know, oftentimes when it suits his needs is a remarkable thing to, uh, to, to watch. And, and it has real consequences for, for, for America and, frankly, things that will be difficult to recover in, in three months or, or four years in three months because you know, confidence is easily lost but, but difficult to rebuild. You, uh, your, your your book looks at how uh, Trump's unpredictability has uh, upended American policy, you know, from China to Russia, North Korea, Iran, Syria, Ukraine, and uh, well, all around the around the world. Let's just start with with China. Where are we at with China? Because this was clearly one of uh, Donald Trump's big initiatives to take on China, but to cut a trade deal. And more recently, he has pivoted into a much, much more aggressive uh, posture, blaming the the pandemic on the Chinese. So, where 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 are we at with with China? Well, the headline is we are spiraling into a into a potential conflict here, right? It's it is escalation upon escalation from from both sides, with genuine concerns about military escalation as well, right? You know, the U.S. has been sailing ships through the Taiwan Strait, and China has been rattling its saber too there, you know, genuine concern about, about uh, how far this might go. But let's take a step back for a bit. Um, the, and I talk about this a lot in the book, you know, Trump's other consistency beyond his deference to Russia is standing up to China. And, and, and this is justified, right? And, and I, I speak in the book about my own personal experience of this because I've studied and covered China for 20 some odd years, but I also served in government in, in Beijing. And I tell the story there about, about how I saw the best and worst of the U.S. approach to China. 
in the in our dealing with the blind dissident Chen Guangchen. If you remember that in 2012, here is this sort of uh, unlikely hero in China, a blind barefoot lawyer, as he was known there, who is punished by China for challenging them on the one China policy, house arrest, etc. Escapes, finds his way to the U.S. embassy in Beijing. And the U.S. Embassy takes him in. I mean, this is this was not an automatic, right? Because that's a big risk in, in the midst of this relationship. But they take in the dissident, and that was a proud moment for America. They're saying, you know what, this is more important to us, right? Supporting uh, freedom and someone willing to stand up for what's right, etc. You know, you know. Now, my experience in there was that soon after he came in, the emphasis came on getting him out. It's like, okay, we've taken enough risk here. Let's find a way to end this. We don't want to upset the broader relationship. And, and I tell that story as a sort of indicator of the way the U.S. has often approached China, which is, which is attempting to stand up for values, U.S. values, but, but often backing off, worried about, well, how is China going to punish us and, and that kind of thing. So Trump upends that and says, you know, we're not going to tolerate this anymore, the stealing of intellectual property, et cetera, um, and deserves credit for that, no question. The question is where we stand today, and this is a fundamental question of all of Trump's approach to the world, is what is the strategy? What is the end game? Standing up is great, and, and calling them out now on, on, on Hong Kong, et cetera, where is it leading? You know, what, How much of this is frankly about the election and looking tough towards China? Because if you look at the trade deal, for instance, you know, the so-called phase one trade deal did not accomplish any of Trump's own big picture uh, you know, beefs with China, you know, for instance, on stealing intellectual property. That's the question. You often will have stands with this president where he does take a stand, but not connected to a broader strategy. And, and that's not me talking. That's his own right. talking. Well, in terms of the larger strategy, and as, as you point out, China was a country that needed to be confronted, but the effective way to, to confront China, of course, would be to uh, get together with our allies and have a global response. And you describe in this book also the alienation from our allies. You know, while you have the president fascinated with uh, with you know Vladimir Putin and Erdogan from from Turkey and uh, and, his, and his buddy Kim from North Korea, uh, he has managed to alienate uh, many of our long standing allies. Could you talk to talk to us a little bit about? Um, you know, w w where America stands with the G7, w w with NATO, because it, it seems on, on story after story now, what we see is that we're sort of in a post-American leadership moment, which also seems rather extraordinary, considering that we have a president who wanted to make America first. But our position globally with our friends has changed dramatically in the last four years. It is. You, you have a president who doesn't seem to see the benefits of allies, right? It, it is purely zero sum. It is as zero sum with them as it is with a Russia or a China. What have you done for me lately? How much have you paid for U.S. deployment in Europe or even South Korea, right? I mean, we're, we're in the midst of an ongoing uh, dispute with South Korea in the midst of a, its ongoing standoff with North Korea. President Trump wants five times the amount from South Korea to keep U.S. troops there and has threatened and may very well follow through on withdrawing U.S. troops or some of them, you know, in that beef, you know, forgetting all the other reasons that you have U.S. forces there. This is one of the things that's going to be most difficult to gain back, um, uh, the breaking in that confidence. It, it is, it's important that Macron and, uh, or Merkel have said in public, we can no longer rely on the U.S. Mm. Uh, as an ally. Um, you know, alliances, Alliances are, are sort of ethereal in a sense that, you know, whatever is written down on paper about mutual defense, et cetera, they're only as good as in how much their members and then their adversaries believe in them. And if your own allies don't trust your commitment to it, but more importantly, if Vladimir Putin hears President Trump criticizing the alliance and also questioning the mutual defense portion of it, the Article 3 portion of it, he then, and this is a worry again of, of the president's own national security advisors, calculates, hmm, I don't know that they're really going to react if I invade Estonia, you know, uh, cause trouble again. I mean, the, hmm. there's a remarkable uh, exchange I have with Peter Navarro in the book, forget Europe for a moment, about Canada, where Peter Navarro 
question whether Canada is really an ally of the U.S. It really matters. He's like, do they? And I, and I, I was like my mouth agape as I'm doing this interview. And I try to convey some of that book. And I say, Canada? Canada. Longest peaceful border in the world, uh, bled with us on nor- from Normandy to Afghanistan. I mean, I told him stories about, I've been embedded in Afghanistan a dozen times. The Canadians were one of our allies that were tip of the spear. They didn't have restrictions about where their forces went, and they paid for it. Um, they paid for it in blood on the ground there. And he said, well, were they really there for us or for their own interests? I said, Canada, really? Are, are you questioning that as an alliance? And I'm thinking if the presidents, and, and by the way, Peter Navarro is no longer just a trade advisor. I mean, he's a COVID advisor for the president. He's a, he's a spokesman for the White House. If that's his view of our closest al- alliance, where, where do our alliances with any country in the world stand? It's, it's, uh, it's disturbing. So the title of the book is The Madman Theory, Trump Takes on the World. What is the madman theory? So uh, the Madman Theory uh, originated with Richard Nixon. A lot of our listen, listeners probably uh, familiar with that. In, in the early 70s, at the worst time in the uh, Vietnam War, President Nixon uh, directed Henry Kissinger, his national security advisor, to tell the North Vietnamese in no uncertain terms that he was just mad enough to order a nuclear strike on North Vietnam. The intention being, wasn't really going to do it, uh, but to gain advantage in those negotiations, have the North Vietnamese back down and give a better deal for a U.S. withdrawal. Uh, there are White House tapes of those conversations where Nixon dictates the words to use. Mm-hmm. Kissinger conveyed that message. Now, he did. Strategy didn't work. Uh, North Vietnamese, as you know, held firm, and, and we know how that war ended for the U.S. But but the reason I brought, the, the, my my reason for naming the book this is that in, in all my interactions with, with his advisors, and, and even going back uh, before I started writing this book, his defenders would often say, this is just the way Trump does things. He keeps mm-hmm. his adversaries off balance by surprising them, uh, by ha- having everybody guessing as to what he's going to do next. And that's the brilliance of the Trump approach. So, so the thought occurred to me, he's got his own madman theory. Now, as I spoke to people who worked for him and, and just watched it play out, the difference between his madman theory and Nixon's, there are a couple. One, he's just as likely to use it on allies as he is on adversaries. An important distinction. Absolutely. And his own advisors, they don't know what he's going to do next. And, and they said that to me on the record. This is the other thing about this book. These are on the record. These are not blind quotes from people who work for him. The McMasters of the world, Joseph Yun, uh, Peter Navarro, Steve Bannon, etc. It, it's on the record quote. He, uh, his own advisors didn't know what he was going to do next. I mean, I tell the story of you know his two withdrawals by tweet from Syria in uh, December 2018 and October 2019. No discussion prior. Uh, his own staff was just as surprised as all of us were when we read those tweets. Uh, you know, the policy making process followed the decision. I tell the story of how. Uh, in North Korea in late 2017, at the height of tensions with them, and Iran in 2019, his own negotiators and diplomats were conveying to the other side, the North Koreans and the Iranians, they didn't know what he was going to do next. And the reason they did that was not to gain advantage. They weren't sort of trying to play the game. They were concerned that we might be on the path to war. So his madman theory is unleashed, not just on the bad guys, but on the good guys as well, and his own staff. And that sets up a remarkable dynamic in, in, in the government. Yeah, r- remarkable. I mean, the, the madman theory is supposed to be a strategy, right? It, it is not supposed to be that you are a madman. Right. I mean, that's the whole point, right? You have you use it as a tactic to get certain things that you have thought out, not um, as an end in and of itself. Okay, so speaking of, of the madman theory, even as you and I are speaking, and we are doing this uh, early on, on, on Tuesday morning in, in, in real time, um, Donald Trump has just tweeted out in the last uh, in the last half hour. I, I know because you've been you know focused on talking with me, you probably haven't seen it, right, Jim? But so I will share it with you, <laughs> John. Because I was going to ask the next question. Explain John Bolton to me. John Bolton, one of the dumbest people I've met in government, and sadly I've met plenty, states often that I respected and even trusted Vladimir Putin of Russia more than those in our intelligence agencies. Well, of course that is not true. 
if the people you met from so-called American intelligence were dirty cops, uh, that's uh, capitalized, um, who have now proven to be sleazebags at the highest level, like James Comey, proven liar James Clapper, and perhaps the lowest of them all, wacko John Brennan, who headed the CIA, you could perhaps understand my reluctance to embrace, exclamation point. <laughs> okay. So lashing out this morning at John Bolton, one of the dumbest people I've ever met in government, who who also says that uh, he was struck up close. He was in the room. He worked with the president and he was struck by the, the fact that uh, the president was much more deferential to Vladimir Putin. And by the way, you don't need to actually have inside information. I mean, I, some of us remember that uh, famous press conference in, in, mm-hmm. in Helsinki. So any, any thoughts about this, first of all, or, 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 or wider thoughts on on on, on the weird decision uh, by Donald Trump to appoint John Bolton and John Bolton's weird decision to go to work for him. Yeah. Well, a couple, one, one thing, just looking at this tweet, it, it is, it is classic Trump in that it's full of a couple of things, one insecurity, but also falsehood, right. Or, or, or misleading, you know, clearly he, you know, he tweets and comments about stuff that he's concerned about. So he, he's trying to develop a defense uh, to the criticism uh, that he respected Vladimir Putin uh, of Russia. And his defense is is a misleading one, right? He's saying it's all because I didn't trust those guys because they were investigating me. Uh, easily belied because of his recent comments doubting U.S. intelligence, right? I mean, he just a couple of weeks ago uh, called the Russian bounty intelligence another Russian hoax. Okay, so here he is again. Brennan, Clapper, they're no longer there. And he's again doubting U.S. intelligence, where it serves him, and once again, refusing to call out Vladimir Putin. So all you have to do is look at the record, and you don't have to look far, just a couple of weeks ago, to belie the statement. But this, you know, this fits in a broader picture. You know, here's the thing. It's not just John Bolton who says that he trusted Vladimir Putin or respected him. As you say, it's in his public comments. In my book, half a dozen people who work with him describe the circumstances and conditions and cannot understand why, you know, uh, you know, McMaster openly asked the question, you know, he, he says it, it, it is contradictory to all the other positions we have in terms of national security. His, uh, you know, that, that Russia's intent to harm the U.S. is not in question by anybody, Intel, Republican, Democrat, etc. And yet the president uh, wouldn't see that. You know, it's it, the, I spoke to other intelligence figures who said that they saw the effects of his admiration for Putin in a couple of instances. It, you know, that I talk about this in the book that, that the intel community's fear with Trump, and this is remarkable to think about, uh, was that he was the subject of an influence operation by the Russians, by Putin himself. What's an influence right. op? It's where you you try to mold someone's view of things to get them to look more like the way you see the world. And via all these personal contacts with Putin, it's the intel agency's view that that's what Putin was trying to do with Trump. And then they see the effects of it. They say that his view of things like his hostility, for instance, to European leaders, I'm talking Western European leaders, right? The leaders of our allies influenced by Putin, that that his hostility to them is uh, further um, kind of inflamed by his interactions with Putin, his understanding of the origins of World War II. You've seen this again in his public comments, right? Forgetting the Molotov-Ribbentrop pact, right? That, you know, that the Russians helped start World War II and kind of forgiving from them for that is uh, almost identical to, to Russian revisionism on its role in the Second World War. You know, so the target of an influence op by Russia and one that seems to have worked on a number of fronts. So what must that be like to be in the national security apparatus, knowing that the president of the United States was targeted by this intelligence op by the Russians and that it has succeeded? I mean, in our in our system, you know, all the power is you know, resides in the president of the United States. And as we, we, we've seen um, you know, whatever the theory might be in reality, there are there are a few checks on him. So. You know, the president complains about the deep state being hostile to him. But if you're in the quote unquote deep state, how rattled are these people by this? They are rattled and concerned on every front of this. Mm. Russia, with North Korea, with Syria. They try 
to control his worst impulses or even slow roll them, right? You know, the Pentagon, no one in the national security infrastructure wanted to reduce U.S. force presence in Germany. Nobody. It doesn't. But you see them kind of bend themselves into pretzels, uh, one, to do it slowly. And by the way, you know, there are folks in the Pentagon who, who will say to me quietly that we hope we can stretch, stretch this out till after the election so it doesn't have to happen, mm-hmm. right? Um, really? And, and they, they find a way to rescue some of those troops, to at least keep them in Europe, although some are coming home. But at the end of the day, he's the commander in chief. You can't always stop him. Now, there are instances where they've had more success. I tell the story in, in Syria of how following each of the president's withdrawal orders in the Pentagon, they were talking openly about, OK, did he really mean take them all out? And if he didn't say that, do we have to take them all out? And let's take some of them out and see if he, if his attention turns. Uh, that's what happened after that first withdrawal order. And I talk about this in the book, his attention did turn. They took a few hundred out, but they were able to keep them on the ground. Then 10 months later, he has another call with Erdogan, says, pull the U.S. troops out. And a lot of folks in the Pentagon say, well, the gig is up, man. I, you know, can we slow roll mm-hmm. this again? Then they come up with an idea. They're like, hey, wait a second. Let's tell them we're there to protect the oil fields. That'll appeal to his kind of economic bottom line view of the world. Oh, and he likes that idea. So a couple of years later, we still got a few hundred troops on the ground there. Yes, they are protecting the oil fields. But by the way, they're also still supporting the Kurdish allies, which no one wanted to abandon, and they're still fighting ISIS. So so there are times when they find ways to work around him, slow roll him. But at the end of the day, he's the commander in chief. He's got a lot of power, and you can't always do that. It does make you wonder what a second term would look like when you can't run out the clock anymore and that the president has finally figured out where the level the levers of power are and he's managed to place people in 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 key positions who will do what he says. Um, the, the, the whole first term was, you know, cycling through some adults in the room, people figuring out how do you how do you game all this? That would be different in the second term, wouldn't it? It would. It, listen, John Bolton's not the only person who fears that Trump would pull out of NATO in a second term, right? Really? Um, there are genuine fears about a reduction, major reduction of U.S. force presence in South Korea. He's, this guy's pissed the South Koreans won't pay him five times more and would reduce, even though everybody who advises him is telling him that would embolden North Korea, who was supposedly uh, right his number one national security goal. Um, uh, Afghanistan, you know, the president already plans to reduce to 5,000 uh, by election day. And by the way, that's driven, I'm told, in part um, by the president being aware of how many troops were in Afghanistan uh, when Obama was still in power and wanted to be l- below that number. Because, of course, he raised the force presence mm-hmm. there coming to office and wants to get it back down again. No connection to the actual force deployment need there as requested by the military, but a calculation based, uh, you know, on politics, um, you know, yeah, possibility of no more force presence there. I mean, in a second term, the things that were kind of half measures in a first term, the concern is they become full measures. So let's go back to John Bolton, though. Um, your, your your take on John Bolton. It was a strange decision by the president to take somebody who was really at the opposite end of, I would say, Republican foreign policy. Uh, you know, John Bolton's a, a hawk. He's an interventionist, uh, you know, obviously a, a saber rattler. Donald Trump ran as America first, uh, pushing a position of isolationism. What 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 is your take on that strange dynamic? Well, I think that the the president, if you look at his hires in the first term, at least in the early part of his first term, a lot of them are straight out of the Republican establishment. And John Bolton, of course, at a sort of more conservative uh, interventionist end of that. But but and it's it's not just him. Uh, Jim Mattis, you know, H.R. McMaster, Fiona Hill, all these people uh, could have easily served in any standard Republican administration. You wouldn't bad an eye, uh, John Bolton might surprise, but after all, you know, W try, you know, g- try to get him into his administration too. So it's not, you know, it's not unprecedented. You know, I think here's a president who uh, does, there's not a lot of process around these hires, right? There's not a pro- lot of process around any of the security, 
uh, decision making in this administration. And I talk about that in the book where the president has completely dismantled it. It's 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 done. The, the decision making fo follows his decisions. There's there's no sort of preamble with many of these decisions. So, um, you know, early in his term, you see a president who was willing to listen to some of the more establishment folks. This is the person you should go with. Uh, and now uh, much less likely to do so. Well, that, that, of course, was the big debate about, you know, do you go into this administration and become part of this, you know, blank show or, or do you, you, you stay out? And, of course, a lot of people said it is really important to be in that room, to be the adult, to be able to temper these decisions and that we appear to be through that phase. But what is the role of Mike Pompeo in all of this? Uh, you know, some of our friends on the right will say, look, you may disagree with Mike Pompeo, but Mike Pompeo is the Trump whisperer, you know, and, and he is still, you know, holding the line. Is, is that the case? Because he seems to become more Trumpy with every passing week. So I asked a lot of people for this book about Pompeo's role. Um, he has his very strong critics. Right. I, I didn't talk to a lot of people who had an enormous amount of confidence in him. Hmm. Uh, the, 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 the read is he's made a calculation. Um, he clearly has not moved the president on Russia. Yes, let Pompeo will issue a statement, for instance, in the last 24 hours on Belarus and say we don't support this. But, you know, a, a statement from your secretary of state when, when you don't have um, the, the commander in chief's backing it doesn't really move the needle. So similarly on uh, you know, the Russian bounties, Pompeo's team leaking that that he did warn Russia away from this kind of thing. But if the president's not doing it, you know, who does the president who, who does Russia listen to? <clears throat> so so on Russia, you know, kind of kind of granting that space and focused very much on China. He, he's focused his energies there. This is where I can be tough. This is where the U.S. can be tough. And, and to be fair to Mike Pompeo, and I've spoken to him personally about this, mm -hmm. he's long been a China hawk, you know, and has long been trying to draw attention there. Uh, so perhaps he's made a calculation. This is where I can make an impact, uh, where the president, where the president and I are on the same page, you know, the, the way he's worked the, the, in, the inside of the state department, uh, and, uh, I, I worked in the state department for a couple of years and, and, uh, spoke to a lot of folks in this administration, the state department is, uh, does not get favorable reviews, um, uh, very political. Uh, very top heavy in in the decision making, uh, but I don't know what percentage of that is a political calculation for for whenever he decides to leave, leave office, but it has consequences. Speaking of some of the personnel moves that were that were made, you know with that you, you have Richard Grinnell as the ambassador to Germany. He's named as the acting national security. What was it? The uh, director of, of of national intelligence and. Uh, the the Senate rolled over on Trump's more permanent ap appointment. It it is striking um, how how successful Trump has been in placing some of his loyalists in some of the most sensitive intelligence positions in the U.S. government. That one, you know, Grinnell in in, in for ODI. I mean, th think of the previous holders of the Director yeah. of National Intelligence, Jim Clapper, fifty years in intelligence for Republican and Democratic administrations. Head of another intel agency, CIA, military intelligence. Uh, th that's a previous occupant to the job. Rick, Rick Rennell, really a political operative, right? And, and this was a move with intent. And, and when he got there before Ratcliffe took over, he was going through that organization. And th there was, a, you know, from folks inside the building, concerns that this was a loyalty purge underway. And this is the thing for all the suppose checks and balances th that we have, the president has a lot of power and that th the influence he's been able to uh, hold over institutions that are meant not to be political, right? I mean, the, the, the Odi in, theory, I, yeah. in theory, I mean, listen, I, I suppose you can make the argument everything is political, but but remember the origins of, of ODNI. This was post 9-11 designed to bring together the intel agencies, one, so they don't miss something again, but two, so that you try to take the politics out of intelligence. Uh, the reverse has happened under Trump, and, and not just in an appointment like that, but in the way the president views and uses intelligence. He advertises the intelligence that supports his point of view and dismisses that which does not. And not just on, say, Russian bounties on US soldiers, but you know the intel view that Iran was in 
complying with the Iran nuclear deal, right? Uh, prior to pulling out of it. Or the intel now that North Korea has expanded, not shrunken, its nuclear program after four years uh, of, of the Trump approach. He doesn't talk about that either. So we have the ultimate politicization of intelligence, both the intelligence itself uh, and, and the intel agencies. And folks fight inside there, you do. I mean, you see Gina Haspel kind of trying to, to, to ride the fence here in the public comments. And I know a lot of people in the building work really hard to stay political. Uh, and you see that even, listen, to have you know the intel community come out and say again, Russia's interfering to help Trump, that's a ballsy move. You know, so you gotta give them credit. Now, who's behind that? Who, who would be the major player behind that? Because that is a ballsy move. Is that Gina Haspel? I think she would be involved and got a lot of respect for her and I've dealt with her. She, you know, she takes her job seriously and does not want to be political. Um, I think that, you know, Evanina uh, and others, you know, some, sometimes if you have the intel, you can't deny it. Right now, I did I did find it notable that even as they were saying that they kind of attached to it. Oh, but but China and Iran are interfering as well. And by the way, they want Trump to lose. Right. And, and I, I just saying that my spidey sense there was that's interesting that they would bring that up at this time. Now, that doesn't mean that China and Iran aren't interfering every time. Every conversation I've had about election interference has said that it's not just Russia, China, Iran and North Korea. They like to mess around as well. But let's talk about degree and specificity. Um, Russia is following the exact same playbook they did in 2016, target the Democratic opponent. Uh, with dirt. And it was Hillary Clinton 2016, DNC emails, Podesta emails. Now it's Joe Biden and uh, this kind of channel of information from Ukraine to friendly Republican lawmakers. Of course, that's the difference here is that you have U.S. sitting lawmakers participating in it. Remarkable. This would include uh, my home state senator, Ron Johnson. Well, listen, yes. I mean, if he's listening to this, he'll say that, you know, he's just you know, finding the best information available, he's doing a service. Uh, but listen, know your source, right? Uh, here you have a pro-Russian Ukrainian politician uh, with with past ties to the KGB who's supplying that information. And lo and behold, it's the Democratic candidate and he's running against Trump. I mean, it doesn't, it, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to, to, to understand <laughs> that that might be questionable information. OK, on, on this issue, I'm, I'm a little bit hung up on this director of national intelligence thing, because I, I mentioned Richard Grinnell. Um, and of course, he was replaced more permanent. He was played, re replaced permanently by John Ratcliffe, who was a uh, member of the House of Representatives. When Ratcliffe's name first came up, um, people looked at him and went, no way. There's no way he's going to yeah. get confirmed. He's not qualified. He's, you know, he fudged his his resume, yeah. et cetera. A year later, it was as if people in the Senate just sort of shrugged their shoulders and said, yeah, screw it. Let's let, let Trump have John Ratcliffe. So we went from there's no way they're ever going to allow a hack like this to become the director of national intelligence to he's the guy right now. What happened there? I think that, well, here, it's it's another example of how over time you know, institutions and processes yield, they yield, you know, uh, a year ago, it was, it was most well, personal stuff, him playing up, as you say, his resume, but also that even Republicans on the relevant committees knew that Ratcliffe was political and that this job is not meant to be political. They knew it, but you put Grinnell in there. And I think partly it was a little bit of relief. Well, at least it's not Grinnell, right? <laughs> you know, there's a little, there's a little bit of that, but also that over time, president's got a lot of power and he moves people. And it was not a fight that Republicans were willing uh, to, to pick in this instance here. Uh, but I'll tell you, you do see some of that reflected. I mean, some of the statements coming out of ODNI just in the last few days are, are you know, they read like the president's tweets. Right. Like attacking the press. You know, this is, you know, I say, is that that's really coming out of the office of the director of national intelligence now? Is that what that institution was meant for? So it's insidious over time. You know, the, the, the president has an enormous effect on our institutions. 
Well, you know, and it also makes me wonder whether or not that that position is has been you know radically and maybe permanently diminished by by this. So let's talk about uh, Belarus because it appears to be on the verge of actually exploding. You had an election, um, all kinds of allegations that the election was stolen by the uh, the autocratic president. Uh, the uh, the challenger has now fled the country. Um, the suggestion is that she's going to form an, a government in exile in Lithuania. Can you give me some perspective on? what we should be watching there and why, you know, where it could go? Well, first for Belarus and then for the U.S. piece in this. But for Belarus, uh, it's it's a sad example of retreat of freedom, right, in, in, the, in the biggest term. Uh, I, I haven't spoken to anybody inside the country or out who, who thinks that was a fair election when somehow Lushenko gets his 80 percent, right? Uh, in fact, there was discussion that he was offered 75 percent for the win. He said, that's not good enough. Give me 80 percent. Um, and then in the wake of that, just to see the use of force, the crackdown, uh, the, the opposition candidate have to flee the country for her own safety. Um, th- that's a sad measure uh, of you know, the, the, the reverse march right, uh, of freedom. And I think you should take it together with what we're seeing happening in Hong Kong, too, right? A vibrant that, that is being put on, under the thumb of Chinese authoritarianism. So that's you know, how, how we should look at it. Plus, Russia brazenly uh, interfering in an election again in, in Europe, right? Uh, so not cowed by any means. Then the U.S. piece is, you know, you, you and I have heard, and they'll repeat it, no one has been tougher on Russia than Trump. First of all, look at the record. Uh, it, it's easily easily uh, contradicted by the many times the president has not stood up or uh, in the, tried to slow roll things that had large bipartisan support, for instance, uh, sanctions, et cetera. But if you look at the record, is Russia more or less bold today than it was four years ago in Syria, in Libya, in a country like Belarus, in terms of uh, interfering in the U.S. election, in terms of uh, running its planes uh, and ships by U.S. military assets around the world? The answer is it's bolder. That's the best test of the approach, uh, because if you have deterred them and intimidated them, then this would not be happening. Clearly, we haven't because they're pushing harder. And I think that's the most important measure. And I try to do that. I do that in the final chapter of the book. I do a before and after on all these countries. Is North Korea more or less of a nuclear threat today than it was four years ago? It's more. It's got a better ballistic missile program and more nukes. Is Iran more or less of a nuclear threat four years later? It's closer to a bomb, not further away from a bomb. And is Russia uh, more aggressive or less aggressive? It's more aggressive. Uh, And the sad fact is China Yes, we as a country are standing up to them, and rightfully so, but is China more or less aggressive, and and, and sadly, more so as well? The book is The Madman Theory, Trump Takes on the World by Jim Shudo. It is an incredible uh, read, and of course, uh, the interesting cover showing a a blindfolded Donald Trump playing, um, striking out at the at the uh, at, at the at the globe, which is a pinata, and he's swinging and he is swinging at it. Jim Shudo, thank you so much for coming on and being so generous with your time today. Appreciate it very much. I enjoyed it, Charlie, and thanks to everybody for listening. I, I really I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back tomorrow, and we will do this all over again.